Excellent, perfect, amazing. Thank you so much. So thank you very much, Massimiliano, for the for the introduction. And of course, thank you, Laura, and all the organizers for giving me the chance to, to be here in front of you today and to talk about some of the research we've been doing in, in Durham uh, with the group. So I have to say that it's going to be a bit more about techniques to look at excited state dynamics, so maybe a bit less of optogenetics, but I will try to make connection with poten potential use of the method that we've been developing. So. To get started, what I would like to do uh, here uh, is to maybe define a bit better what I mean by non bonaparte molecular dynamics, and also just to match a bit the vocabulary for what I will develop further on. So the dream in the group is basically to do what I will show you in this little skip. You have a molecule, and that's an important thing. I want to treat molecular system in their full dimensionality. You have a molecule in the ground state, and that you can see here represented as uh, the ground vibrational and electronic states, and say that you come with a pulse of light. Okay, so we will consider here a short pulse of light to make things simpler. And this will excite this molecule and trigger here the formation of a non stationary state. In other words, no more a proper eigenstate for your excited state here. And in other words, that's a nuclear wave packet that will acquire a certain dynamics. So this wave packet will relax, uh, as we all know, right? And it will reach a region here where two electronic states might become close in energy. This will break the beloved bond open MR approximation and lead via non adiabatic couplings, which is a coupling between nuclear and electronic motion, to the splitting of our wave packet. So I don't think that I need to motivate really why we would like to investigate such processes here to, to the audience. Uh, let me just give you one of my favorite examples of non bond open MR effects with this long time exposure picture of fireflies in a field in Japan. So you see the little glowing insect here all around. But if I were to apply the born oppenheimer approximation to this picture, what I would get is that, because I will simply quench a process called chemiluminescence, which implies non born oppenheimer processes. So that's a kind of interesting living example of non born oppenheimer processes here. But to come back to my picture that I was mentioning earlier, when I show you this picture and I say, oh, I would like to describe that uh, for a molecular system, in principle, you should stop me at this point, because basically what I'm saying is that I would like to solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation for a molecular system. So for a molecular here wave function, when I have electrons, nuclei and time, and we already struggled quite a lot with the electronic Schrodinger equation in a time independent picture. So what is very clear here is that we will have to do some nasty approximations. So one first step when we look at this molecular Schrodinger equation here is just to simplify our life by taking here for this molecular wave function a given representation. In other words, what we're going to say is that we're going to use this born one representation, which is one way to look at the molecular wave function, where we say that the molecular wave function here can be represented as a, an infinite sum, a linear combination, if you want, of time independent electronic eigenstates here multiplied by time dependent nuclear position dependent coefficients that we will call nuclear wave functions. And basically here, this bond one representation is nothing but what I showed you here. It is nuclear wave function evolving on different electronic states, and the electronic states are somehow static. You don't see a dynamics in the potential energy surface. They are static, OK? But this bond one representation also show you all the complexity of dealing with this kind of processes, because it means that we will need somehow to get the elect to deal with the electronic structure problem. How do I determine, for example, the potential energy surface, and not just for the ground state, but also for the excited state now? How do I deal with this term here, the nuclear forces? And also, how do I deal with these non adiabatic coupling vectors that you heard about in the previous talk, which are basically terms that couple electronic state I with electronic state J via nuclear displacement? You couple electronic and nuclear motion. Therefore, that's the non-bond open neighbor term that we really need in this context here. Then, how do we deal with the environment? So, being it, for example, a pulse of light or also a protein environment or solvent environment. And last but not least, how do we deal with nuclear dynamics? Because I showed you this nuclear wave packet moving around. But of course, if I want to look at molecules in their full dimensionality, I will struggle to do that. So we need to do some approximation there. So just to summarize this very first part here, what I would like to say is what we're looking at uh, in the group is to find ways to get reliable methods. 
for excited state dynamics, where we can get at least a qualitative picture and we can believe this qualitative picture. It is sure with the approximation that we are doing that we are not really looking for a quantitative, extremely accurate picture, but we are fine with that. Okay, so in the following, I will mostly focus here on the nuclear dynamic part, but I was quite excited just to present a tiny, tiny things about electronic structure problem because we look at this kind of things from time to time in the group. And we recently had a very exciting result. I mean, I don't know if it's exciting or scary or whatever, uh, but uh, Emmanuel Massili, and you've heard about his name already quite a lot in this, this workshop in Massimo Stoke, for example, um, has discovered that actually there is a massive problem with the electronic structure method called ADC2, which is commonly used to study rather large molecular system, thanks to this single reference character. And what he discovered is that actually you may have a massive flow when you use this molecule in combination with molecule containing carbonyl groups. So when you have carbonyl groups in your molecule and you look at the excited state dynamics, for example, of the system, you may encounter a crossing way too fast in the dynamics as compared to what you would have if you look at high level method like XMS cas 2 So I don't have time to talk that much about that, but I just wanted to say, to give you a little caveat, if you use this method called ADC2, be careful if you have a carbonyl containing molecules. And if you want more information, we have an article that has just been published very recently here uh, in PCCP. So just to come back, in the context of this talk, that's my expected trajectory of this presentation. So I just give you a brief introduction by what I mean by non vulnerable dynamic dynamics and what are our goals. And I'm going to mostly focus on a strategy called the ab initio multiple spawning to describe the excited state dynamics. So I'm going to try to show you a bit what are some of the interesting features, how we can actually test and compare aims with, say, other methods like surface hopping, and also how we can make it cheaper to try to use it for larger molecular system, which eventually may be of interest for a community looking at like uh, optogenetics, uh, molecule, uh, molecule of interest for optogenetics. So let me get started by giving you just a brief overview of what are the strategies that are existing to look at non-aerotic molecular dynamics. So there are basically two dominant strategies. On the left here, what you have are all the nuclear wave packet approaches. You treat your nuclei fully quantum mechanically. That's why you would do, for example, with method like MCTDH, and that's, of course, what you would dream to do. If you can afford that for your molecular system, that's where you need to go, because that's really an, an optimal way to get a very accurate description of your neuromatic dynamics. However, the problem is that the cost of such methods makes that you may have to pre-select some nuclear degrees of freedom, because you won't be able to treat that many in the context of this type of methods. And in addition, you may also have to pre-compute your potential energy surfaces and inject already some a priori knowledge on your, on, your, on your simulation to do that. At the other end of the spectrum, what you can say is that this nuclear wave packet actually behaves quite classically. So what you could do is to use mixed quantum classical method, like for example, the celebrated trajectory surface hopping, where you say that you will describe your nuclear wave packet as a swarm of independent classical trajectories, but these classical trajectories now will have the possibility to jump between states. So say you start here with a given initial condition in an excited state, and you run these trajectories, and this trajectory over the course of the dynamics can, when you have neuromatic processes, jump from one state to the other and carry on the dynamics here using the forces, in this case, coming from S0, the ground state. What you can do then is to take a second trajectory, do the same game, but this one, say, we just carry on on S1. You do the same thing for another trajectory, and so on, and so on, and so on. You sample a lot of trajectories. And at the end of the day, what you hope for is that the distribution of these trajectories should mimic somehow the nuclear wave packet dynamics. But you know that this is only uh, an approximation by definition because surface hopping is using the so-called independent trajectory approximation, where all these trajectories are completely uncoupled and they cannot talk to each other. So you will miss some let's say important effects like decurrences when the wave packet is moving for example away uh, splitting at the quantum intersection that will be somehow hard to get with trajectory surface hopping in its original formulation now there are some alternative strategies that try to mix if you want the best or i hope the best of both worlds and those strategies are based on the idea of trajectory basis functions so trajectory basis functions can be seen as a sort of multidimensional Gaussian that you use now to expand your nuclear wave function. So you look at your nuclear wave function, say in electronic state I here, and you use an expansion here of these big objects that are nothing 
but multidimensional Gaussian with a center R, P, with alpha and a phase gamma. They have a coefficient in front. And what you can do then is basically evolve those Gaussian. So let me just give you a little example here. So you have at time t0 this nuclear wave packet that you would like to describe. And let's say that you can describe it by these three Gaussian that you have here. What you're going to do is to propagate the Schrodinger equation in the basis of this Gaussian, meaning that the Gaussian will talk to each other. That's very interesting. So they will exchange some C amplitude, meaning that over time, when they will move around, what you will see is that they can become more or less important based on the Schrodinger equation. But more importantly, those Gaussians will move with the wave packet. Okay, so they have a certain dynamics. You can see them as a sort of moving grid points. And the way we move these Gaussian will create different strategies. If you move those Gaussian along quantum trajectories, you are using the variational multi-configuration Gaussian, VMCG strategy that is coming basically from MCTDH. If you move the trajectories along Ehrenfest trajectories, you are doing the multi-configurational Ehrenfest dynamics. And if you move this Gaussian along classical trajectories, you are doing the full or ab initio multiple spawning. So what is important to state at this point is, is that in the limit where you will use enough of these Gaussian functions, you don't actually care how you move them around. And therefore, in the limit of a large number of Gaussian functions, all these methods will point towards the exact numerical solution of the Schrodinger equation. And I'm going to show you that in a second. So in the full or ab initio multiple spawning, what we are doing here is to propagate uh, uh, Gaussian classically along uh, and they are frozen so they have a frozen width as you can see alpha does not depend on time anymore and we're going to extend the number of these Gaussian function as we need it say you start here on s1 with one Gaussian and you evolve this Gaussian classically along this surface very much like we do in surface hopping for example but when you reach this region of strong elasticity, what you're going to do is to spawn a new function, you create a new function, you extend your basis. It's not like in surface hopping where you jump. Here you keep the one on S1, you just add another one on S0. And these two Gaussian functions will talk to each other. They will be coupled. And you can spawn more functions as you need them to describe smoothly the transfer of amplitude between the different states. One of the interesting things of the ab initio multiple spawning is that you can derive it from first principle. If I take this equation here and I plug it into the Bonhomme representation and take everything into the time dependent molecular Schrodinger equation, what I can get here is an equation that is nothing but the time dependent Schrodinger equation, but now expressed in an electronic basis and in a basis of this moving trajectory basis functions. Okay, so that's the running equation that will tell you how the C's that are here are evolving and coupled. And this coupled is really an important point. The Gaussian are coupled via this Hamiltonian matrix element. And it's so important that I'm, I'm going to bother you just a tiny bit more about that in the next slide. If I zoom onto one element of this matrix that you see here, say the elements that couples the Gaussian K and K prime, it can have different scenario. So the first one would be if the two Gaussian are on the same state, like K and M here. If the two Gaussian are on the same state, they will be coupled via this blue term that you see here. So you have the nuclear uh, kinetic energy operator, and you have the electronic energy here. If the two Gaussian are on a different state, say K and L here, they will be coupled through this monstrous term here, the red one. But if you look at the center here, you will recognize what I defined earlier as being the noyabatic coupling term. So the term that kind of mediate the transfer of amplitude between different states. The last term that you see here that depends on the second order couplings is actually contributing both an intra and in interstate couplings. So this matrix element, if you were to solve them exactly, will give you an in principle exact solution of the time dependent Schrodinger equation if you have enough Gaussian. However, there's a catch here. And the catch is the fact that if you look, for example, at this term here, what it means is an integral over the full nuclear configuration space that contains the electronic energy. In other words, I need to know the electronic energy or the potential energy surfaces over the full nuclear configuration space, which for molecular system in full dimension is just not possible. I'm back to the quantum dynamics problem, if you want. So what we're going to do here is to move from the, in principle, exact full multiple spawning to the one that we use with molecule called ab initio multiple spawning. And by doing that, we're going to do some approximation on this matrix element. What we're going to do is to approximate the electronic energy. We're going to look at the centroid position 
between two Gaussians. We take the Gaussian product of the Gaussian, give you at the center of the product the centroid position. And what we do at this centroid position is a Taylor expansion of the electronic structure quantity of interest. So you have the term for the zero, which is just the electronic energy at this centroid position. So here, then you have the first order term, second order term, and owing on the uh, locality of the Gaussian, we're gonna, without any shame, only keep the term of order zero. That's a strong approximation. And once more, I'm gonna motivate it a bit later on. But if you do that, and you go back to the matrix element now that we use in ab initio multiple spawning, so for molecular system, you see that things become much simpler because now this electronic energy is no more in this integral because it just depends on the centroid position. It does not depend on R, the entire configuration space for the nuclei anymore. Same thing for the, from the, norm the normatic coupling terms. So in other words here, if I can run my trajectories ab initio on a given excited state, uh, uh, what I can do then is to see how they talk with each other by computing at their centroid position, just an extra electronic structure term, the energies or the normatic couplings. And then I can see how they're talking to each other in this approximate framework. And you can use for that any method that you like, CAS SCF, CAS PT2, TDDFT, any time that you get all these parameters that you need here, all these electronic structure quantities. We do just a tiny other approximation, and is the fact that when you look at the original, the parent trajectory basis function, so the parent Gaussian, what we're going to do is that this Gaussian that you have at time t0, we're going to consider that they are uncoupled at time t0. So they don't talk to each other. Why? Because all these Gaussian that are very much localized because you just push your wave packet in an excited state are going to move away very rapidly in the dimensionality of a molecular system. And therefore, we don't want to waste our time computing the couplings as it will become very small. However, when a parent is spawning new functions, so these new lines that you see here, we're going to compute all the couplings between these functions. We just don't compute the coupling between the parent functions. And that's called the independent first generation approximation. And now, thanks to that, I can just show you this plot here, where from quantum dynamics, what we do here is to limit the number of basis function, this Gaussian that we use, we arrive in the full multiple spawning if the Gaussian are moving along classical trajectories. Then we apply this independent first generation approximation and we approximate this matrix element to a certain point of order zero. And you have the ab initio multiple spawning. But you see that I can really trace my approximation from quantum dynamics to the ab initio multiple spawning here. So what are the exciting features of the initio multiple spawning? Well, first of all, you've seen it now and you're expert on Hamiltonian uh, matrix element of the initio multiple spawning. We can actually add physics as we want. We can very easily extend the method. For example, we extended it to include spin orbit coupling and treat intersystem crossings. So you will have now Gaussians that have different amplitudes for the different sublevels, say, of a triplet state, and they will be coupled to the other triplets and singlet via spin orbit coupling. This is an easy extension where you can use and treat internal conversion and intersystem crossing in the very same way. What we can also do is to add the effect of an external electric field or laser pulse, if you want, so that we can start the dynamics from the ground state, come with a laser pulse, and now spawn function on an excited state to describe the transition from a given the ground state to the excited state. We can look at the photo excitation process if you want. So that's kind of very easy to do in AIMS. And you can do it in a rather rigorous way here by just extending your molecular Hamiltonian with extra terms. Another feature that is really interesting in AIMS is the fact that we have this control approximation. It's a bit in contrast with surface hopping, where basically it is rather an ad hoc al algorithm of a role. Here we know how we can converge the equation. That's the plot that I kind of show you here. But I couldn't really sleep very well at night until I kind of actually convinced me numerically that I can do this trip here back to quantum dynamics. So what we did with Benoit Mignolet is to kind of just use a very simple system, lithium hydride. So two states, one dimension, something I can solve in, with quantum dynamics, right? But what we did was to start on the ground state and to come with a very short pulse of light to excite the molecule and then see how this molecule interacts via the use of the time dependent dipole moment here that is defined in the following way where this is the molecular uh, uh, wave function here. So why do we look at the time dependent dipole moment? Because it's a very tough quantities to get. If you look at population, it's actually quite forgiving. But if you look at this quantity here, you need to have a good interaction between your Gaussian on the same state and on different states. 
So when we do that, what we can do is actually do the game where we start from here and we try to remove the approximation one after the other and see if we reach the result from quantum dynamics. So that's what we obtain here. In red, you have the dipole moment here of a time for the quantum dynamics result, so the exact result. And you see that the dipole moment is oscillating like that. These oscillations are not Rabi oscillation because the pulse is over once this gray area here is done. What you see here with this oscillation is the fact that the two wave packets are forming a transient electronic wave packet, and that's what is called a quantum beating between them. And as the S1 wave packet is moving away from the front condon region, this dampen this oscillation, as you can see here, until you reach this region where basically the two wave packets are if decohered one with respect to each other. If you look at the ab initio multiple spawning here, what you can see is basically that surprisingly for us, we thought that it would just break down immediately, but it can recover some of the oscillations here, even though it runs out of steam and start to lose here these amplitudes. But to do that, we only use two Gaussians. So of course, this is a very strong approximation and the independent first generation approximation, which is good for multidimensional system, but bad in low dimension is really here start to start to hurt uh, very, very painfully. But now if we look at the full multiple spawning, so we remove the independent first generation and we compute all the matrix elements exactly, what you will see is that this black line follows the red line very, very nicely. Well, very nicely, but you can be picky and say that here is not actually in such a good agreement. And that's because we only use 18 Gaussian to describe here these dynamics. If you start to add more Gaussian, for example, you put more Gaussian on the S1 state, you get this orange curve here, and you start to have a better now alignment over the entire course of the dynamics. So with this, I'm quite happy because I know that I have a control set of approximations where I can always kind of push a bit my approximation to see whether it will change my results, something that you cannot do, for example, in surface. Okay. So another thing here uh, that I would like to mention is the fact that we can couple ab initial multiple spawning quite easily with GPU accelerated electronic structure calculation. And this allows us to kind of look at, I would say, interesting molecule. So here you have an example of an atmospheric molecule. Here you have the, mole the, the example of the dimethylamino benzonitrile, a very uh, well-known molecule for its dual fluorescence. And here at the center, you have another molecule that I would like just to mention very briefly here. And it's the pro-vitamin D here. And we're going to look at pro-vitamin D, how when you send light on this molecule, it can ring open here to form pre-vitamin D. Or if you want, in a more honest way, how a decorated cyclohexadiene upon light absorption can become a, uh, a decorated hexatriene here. So this is a rather large molecular system for noyavatic dynamics during ab initio, but we wanted to see what we can do with ab initio multiple spawning on this molecule. So for provitamin D, when you're in the front condon region, you have two states that are of importance, S1 and S2. S1 is the bright state, and S2 is a state that has a doubly excited character. Upon the activation, you can potentially meet the S2 state. You can reach the minimum, reach a conical intersection that is depicted here, and you can go back to the ground state in a closed way or in an open way. So what we're going to do here is to look at this system. So it's a 51 atom molecule. We're going to consider three electronic states. We're going to use theta vh CF, which is our compromise between efficiency and accuracy here. But we know for cyclohexadiene and hexatriene that it reproduces the MSK PT2 results in this particular case, not just for the energies, but also for the topology of the conical intersection. We're going to use up to 330 Gaussian functions and up to 2 picosecond of dynamics. So that's a really heavy calculation. So what we obtain then is here population of the electronic state over time. And we started on the S1 state. And what you can observe here is a bi-exponential decay of the S1 populations towards the ground state. This bi-exponential decay has been observed experimentally, which is really, uh, but was not observed when you with surface hopping using TDDFT. So we already could recover this by exponential decay, decay. And if we fit our results here for the different uh, two Gaussians, so lifetime for the first Gaussian, lifetime for the first, the second, sorry, exponential decay here, you will see that is in actually good agreement with the range of experimental value that is ob um, observed. The by exponential decay is explained by the fact that you have a sort of non-statistical dynamics out of equilibrium dynamic of the wave packet, which very rapidly hit the conical intersection and then starts to spread. So the hitting the conical intersection is this first decay. And then it starts to spread and enter into the intersection seam only 
much more, more slowly. And that's why you have this second part of the decay here. So we were very happy because we could run that and, and simulate that on GPUs. But what was even better is that some months later, uh, uh, some experimentalists uh, reported transient absorption data where they actually used the model of this out of equilibrium dynamics to understand the data and could really rationalize very nicely the data based on this new idea that was coming from this ab initio multiple spawning data. So while for us it was like an interesting game to play with GPUs, apparently it was also quite useful in understanding better some experimental data that have been around for quite some time. So now one of the questions that we may ask is we have this ab initio multiple spawning, but we also have surface hopping. So basically, how can we compare different methods when we look at molecular system? Because it's quite, it's not really obvious how we can compare different methods in a rather fair way. So that was a challenge that, uh, that uh, my PhD student Leah uh, decided to take. And she decided to kind of try to find a way to express the well-known Tully models for non-aromatic dynamics into, into a molecular version. So what are the Tully model? So there are these models that you see here where uh, that Tully devised in the 90s to test normatic dynamics in one dimension. Okay, so you have the example here of a single crossing. So you have the ground state and the excited state potential. Here you have a multiple crossing case. And here in this case, you have the case where the system can go through a crossing and then recross at a later time. So a sort of reflection process. So Leah worked super hard to try to find actually molecules that will show the same features. And what she observed is that if you look at ethylene, it behaves very much like a single crossing event. So it's a sort of molecular version of Tully-1. This DMABL molecule that I mentioned earlier actually behaves very much like the Tully model 2 because you are on the S1 state, it goes back on the S2 states, then goes back to the S1 state. So it does multiple crossings. And fulvin here is actually, thanks to its slow conical intersection, doing a reflection process where the molecule arrive, hit the conical intersection, gets to the excited states. And here, this is time that I'm plotting in this part here. So it means that here, when you see this part of the curve, is basically when the molecule, after hitting an intersection, is actually coming back to the same intersection again. So we do have here a sort of molecular version of the Tully models. Now, how do you compare surface hopping and AIMS? So that's actually a quite tricky thing to do because surface hopping needs quite a lot of initial condition to converge not only the sampling of initial conditions, but also the sampling of the neurobatic processes. So what we did was to select a set of initial condition that will be uh, common to ab initio multiple spawning and surface hopping. They are available in the supporting information as well as all the parameters that we use of this article here. So if you want to use them to test your method, please just go ahead. And what the only thing that we did is that surface hopping, we repeated each initial condition 10 times to really make sure that we also somehow converge or have a better convergence of the stochastic processes taking place at non-hermetic transitions. So here, what I will show you is just a result for our molecular study model 2, which is this dimethylaminobenzonitrile molecule here. What you can see here on the upper plot is energies of a time, I mean, time here, and you have energies. And the dots here symbolize where the trajectory is in surface opening. And you see it is on S2, then goes on S1, then later on it's going to cross and go back into S2, S1. So we have tons of multiple crossing between, between S2 and S1. In the lower plot, you see the result for the ab initio multiple spawning, surface opening is original formulation, and surface opening with a decoherence correction. And what you see here is that surface opening in its original version actually departs in its result from both AIMS and surface of being with a decurrence correction. And it departs here at a time where if you look at this plot here that gives you the average number of pops in surface hopping, we see that we reach here two pops. In other sense, when we start to enter in a range when we have multiple crossing between states, which is known to be something quite bad for surface hopping in its original formalism, but that can be fixed with a decurrence correction which makes these two now in rather close agreement. So that's an interesting test if you want to look at methods that include this decoherence correction in a more natural way, for example. So now I, I, I seem to have said that habitual multiple spawning is a very interesting method, but it has drawbacks. And one of the center drawbacks of the initial multiple spawning is that it can, in some cases, become very rapidly super expensive. 
Why? Because if you have a, 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 a Gaussian that starts to spawn a lot of Gaussian, don't forget that to connect all the Gaussian together, we need to actually, uh, we need to actually compute all this electronic structure between different, um, different molecules, different Gaussians, meaning that we have a quadratically scaling of the number of electronic structure calculation with respect to the number of Gaussian functions. So it gets very expensive. But what we also observe is that these Gaussian become very weakly coupled during an AIMS run. So basically, we should be able to actually get rid of some of these Gaussian that are not coupled with the entire swarm. And that's one of the ideas here that we call the stochastic uh, selection ab initio multiple spawning that I will just show you here briefly with this little scheme. Consider a Gaussian here that is evolving. So you have this trajectory here. And you will start to spawn a new Gaussian. So you have this new line that symbolizes a new Gaussian. And we have here this dashed line. And it's, the dashed line will be dark to symbolize a strong coupling between the Gaussian. Over the course of the dynamics, it's possible that one of the Gaussian can actually move far away and becomes weakly coupled, weakly coupled in terms of its Hamiltonian matrix element, or we can say the overlap between the Gaussian functions. In this particular case, we're going to detect this moment here, and we're going to just perform a stochastic selection of our Gaussian. What do I mean by that is I take all the Gaussian, I look which ones are grouped together. For example, these ones are all coupled together, so I'm not going to touch them. They are part of one group. This one is alone, so I'm just going to leave it alone. That's a second group. And what I'm going to do then is to compute the population of this group, the population of this group, throw the dice, and select stochastically one of this group. In this particular case, we may uh, select this one and carry on the dynamics now only with this Gaussian. So what I'm going to do then is actually to rerun the same initial condition a second time with a different seed for the random number, such that I may have a chance, for example, to sample also this branch. But you can see that in this way, I will decouple my Gaussian. So we did some tests on this very simple prototypical uh, molecule. So the protonated formaldehyde here, so model of, uh, of retinal where you have the population on S2 and population on S1. And what I would like just to see here is that in red, you have the ab initio multiple spawning results. And if you look, for example, at the blue curve or at the gray curve, they are the one resulting from this stochastic selection applied quite aggressively. And you see that in both cases, we reproduce the result quite nicely. More importantly, if you look at the average number of trajectory basis functions here, what you will see is that in AIMS is constantly growing during the dynamics while with the stochastic selection, it remains very, very close. OK, so that's just a test. But we actually did a lot of other tests, and we also compare it to surface opening. So we tested this approach with cyclopropanone, with diphene, and with our Tully model, uh, uh, molecular Tully model 3, fulvin here. And let me just show you fulvin because it's quite interesting. So in fulvin, here you have the S1 population and time. What you observe here is that AIMS is not giving the same result at surface hopping, even when you apply a decoherence correction. AIMS shows that the population decays, and there is a tiny recurrence on the excited states, but that's it. While in surface hopping, the recurrence is happening on the S1 state is much bigger. If we use our strategy, the stochastic selection AIMS, what is important to realize here is that all these methods actually capture the very same dynamics as the ab initio multiple spawning. In other words, even if they are being cheaper and is an approximation to AIMS, we still keep the good description of the neuromatic processes that we have in AIMS. And this is because we only remove Gaussian when they are far away and they are decoupled, not during the neuromatic processes. So if you look at the expected number of electronic structure call here for our, uh, for our uh, simulation, what you have with this dashed line here is the result for surface hopping, the lines that I showed you here. So it is absolutely constant because you always have the same number of electronic structure call per time step for the trajectories. In AIMS, as I told you, it grows quadratically. So it goes really, really rapidly and becomes more expensive than surface hopping. Note that this plot is in a log scale here. But what is really interesting to see is that with the stochastic selection AIMS that is fully converged here, there are a period of time where we actually cheaper than surface hopping, or very, very close in cost here. So it's quite interesting, because it means that we have the stochastic selection version here that reproduces the AIMS result, but is somehow close to be competitive with AIMS. But there is one thing that we didn't like, is the fact that here we actually have a new parameters to set. We have to define when Gaussian become uncoupled. 
And that's one of the projects that we discussed with uh, another PhD student, so Yuri Glassman. And I just asked him whether we can find a way to make stochastic selection parameter free. And what you realize actually is when you look at the decay of the Gaussian in Ames, they all mostly decay as a Gaussian. So what you see here is the decay of the overlap of Gaussians for full swarm of uh, ethylene, fulvine, cyclopropanone, and they all decay as a Gaussian here. And this is interesting because it's reminiscent with something that we know from the 90s in a paper by Schwartz, Bittner, Presto, and Roski, where they propose a model to, uh, sim to simulate the decoherence the decorrent lifetime of multidimensional Gaussian in the following way. So we can predict how multidimensional Gaussian will decay if we look at the difference of forces between one Gaussian, this one, and the force applied on the other Gaussian that is on a different state at a given time, at an initial time, time zero. And if we compare this lifetime with the one that we can compute from Ames, because we actually propagate this Gaussian, so we can measure this decoherence lifetime in Ames, what you see is that they're not perfectly correlated, but at least the model decay times, the one of, uh, of Roski Espresso, um, uh, actually is always larger than the one we observe in Ames. In other words, what we can do is to actually add give to the Gaussian at the moment where they are created a lifetime for which we consider that they will be coupled. And after this lifetime, whatever happens, we're going to trash them. That's we're going to apply this stochastic selection. So we have the spawning time here when we create a new Gaussian function. We compute at this time the decay lifetime. We add this decay lifetime to the time at which we are now. And at this time, so the time of the spawning plus the decay time, we're going to perform a stochastic selection based on population. We are just basically giving some time to this Gaussian to interact, but then we remove them. So we call that the ab initio multiple spawning with informed stochastic selection in Swiss. And when we tested it for the same system here, and let's focus here on Fulvin, we still obtain an extremely good agreement. So if you look at the red line here with the ab initio multiple spawning, same thing with ethylene, cyclopropanone here. And more interestingly, Ames Swiss, as it's pretty hardcore on its selection process, is even cheaper than the ESS aims that I showed you earlier. So if you look at this red versus blue curve here for the number of electronic structure call, what you will see is that it's always cheaper than SS aims, meaning that it's going to be even more competitive, say, with a surface open calculation, while still preserving the good description that you have in aims for the normatic processes. So with that, let me just summarize. Uh, I, I wanted to present this ab initio multiple spawning as a rather rigorous strategy for normatic molecular dynamics, for which you can uh, add intersystem crossings, internal conversion, and you can also describe photo excitation processes on a very equal footing here. And also to show you a sort of hierarchy of method around this ab initio multiple spawning that we've been developing around the idea of stochastic selection, so stochastic selection aims and these aims with strategies. And we see aims with really as a sort of a cheap way to do a stochastic selection, uh, an, um, sorry, as a cheap way to do an ab initio multiple spawning calculation that could be potentially an interesting complement to surface hopping when you look at larger molecular system, or at least to see if surface hopping or benchmark surface hopping if you want. Now, for developing additional methods for diabetic uh, models, we strongly advise to kind of have a look at these molecular tunneling models, which offer a nice way to compare different methods. So with that, let me just Thank the people who contributed to this work. So the AEDC2 uh, question and the problem that we uh, discovered has been uh, done by Emanuele and Antonio in the group. And then the stochastic selection uh, project was done with Lea, who also did the, mole uh, the molecular Tony models. And Yorick uh, worked also on the stochastic selection and on the ab initio multiple responding with uh, informed stochastic selection, so aim Swiss. Uh, let me also thanks uh, all the funding agency and of course, thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions.